When studying atoms, there are some basic numbers, notations, and calculations that we can use in order to study and discuss atoms. One of those numbers is an atomic number. The atomic number is the number of protons that are in the nucleus. It is normally represented by the letter Z in symbols and calculations. Remember that every element has its own unique number of protons. For example, carbon has six protons, hydrogen has one proton, oxygen has eight, as mentioned in the previous screencast. Also remember that because atoms are neutral, the number of protons and the number of electrons have to be equal to each other in a neutral atom. So if the number of protons in carbon is six, the number of electrons in a neutral atom of carbon will also be six. Most of the time, this atomic number is found at the top of each square on the periodic table. Sometimes it will be in the left top corner or the right top corner or sometimes even the top center of each square. When writing the atomic symbol for an element, the atomic number is always written in the bottom left-hand corner of the atomic symbol. You can see the general form for the atomic symbol written down here in the lower right-hand corner, and the atomic number, or letter Z, written in the lower left corner of that general notation. Another number that's important when notating atomic symbols is the mass number. The mass number is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. It is symbolized by the letter A and is always written in the top left-hand side of the atomic symbol. Now remember that John Dalton had proposed that all elements that were identical to each other had the same size, the same mass, and the same properties. But then James Chadwick discovered the neutron, and we learned that atoms of the same element could actually have different masses. Those atoms are called isotopes. Isotopes are atoms of the same element that have a different number of neutrons. That varying number of neutrons causes a different mass. So you can see in the picture over on the left-hand side that in the scale, the hydrogen on the left-hand side has a mass number of 1, and the hydrogen on the right-hand side has a mass number of 2. One isotope of hydrogen is heavier than the other, but this does not affect its chemical behavior. Also, sometimes you might find that instead of the word isotope, you may hear the word nuclide, but they're the same thing. Hydrogen actually has three different isotopes. Protium is the most common. Most of the hydrogen that's found in the universe, 99.9% .9 of all the hydrogen that exists, is in this form. Protium has one proton, and there are different ways of writing the chemical notation for hydrogen. You can either write it with the word hydrogen, followed by the number one, which is the mass number, or you can write its atomic symbol, which is an H. Top left-hand corner is the mass number, and in the bottom left-hand corner is the number of protons, so one and one. The second isotope of hydrogen is called deuterium. Deuterium has one proton and one neutron. And so since both protons and neutrons have a mass of one, you can write the element symbol for hydrogen as the word hydrogen, followed by a mass number of two, or you can write the atomic symbol for hydrogen with the letter H, and then the two in the top left-hand corner, and a one in the bottom left-hand corner. The third isotope of hydrogen is called tritium. Now tritium is radioactive, which means its nucleus is not stable and it falls apart and emits radiation. Tritium has one proton and two neutrons and can be symbolized by writing hydrogen three or by the atomic symbol notated here. Here I'll give you a couple of examples of how to determine nuclear symbols. How many protons, neutrons, and electrons make up a bromium-80 isotope? All right, so this top number, this 80, that represents the mass number, and this bottom number, 35, represents the number of protons. So I know that the number of protons is equal to 35, because that bottom left-hand number is 35. Because this is a neutral atom, I also know that the number of electrons is equal to 35, because the number of positive charges and the number of negative charges have to be equal to each other. Remember that this number 80 is the mass number. And the mass number equals the number of protons plus neutrons together.
So if I just want to solve for the number of neutrons, I need to take that mass number of 80 and subtract out the number of protons. So 80 minus 35 would give me 45 neutrons. I can also do the opposite and determine the nuclear symbol for carbon-13. The symbol for carbon is a C. And we know that this number here, this 13, is the mass number. And so that number 13 will get written in the top left-hand corner. And in the bottom left-hand corner is the number of protons, or the atomic number. So I would need to look on a periodic table and find that the atomic number for carbon is 6. This is the nuclear symbol for carbon. Now when you're looking at the periodic table, there is also a number in the bottom of each box that's called the relative atomic mass. How these numbers were calculated is that carbon-12 was chosen to be the standard for comparison of all the elements on the periodic table. And it's determined that carbon-12 has a mass of 12 atomic mass units, or 12 AMUs. Now one atomic mass unit is equal to 1 12th the mass of a carbon atom. And when I'm comparing other elements on the periodic table, I can do all of that relative to carbon-12. So if I were comparing the mass of, say, one carbon-12 atom and one hydrogen atom, hydrogen weighs 1 12th the mass of a carbon-12 atom. So I can say that the element hydrogen has a mass of 1 AMU. If I compare the mass of oxygen to carbon, it's just a little bit heavier. It's about 4 thirds the mass of carbon-12. So 4 thirds of 12 is 16 atomic mass units. And if I was comparing the mass of a magnesium atom and a carbon atom, a magnesium atom is about twice the mass of a carbon-12 isotope and therefore has an atomic mass of 24 AMU. It's important to notice that each of the subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons, have their own individual mass. The mass of a proton is 1.007. The mass of a neutron is almost identical, 1.009. And the mass of an electron is significantly smaller. Remember that you would need about 2,000 electrons to equal the mass of one proton. But normally we take those very precise measurements and round them off to whole numbers. So a proton would have a mass of one, a neutron would have a mass of one, and an electron would have a mass of zero. The average atomic mass is found at the bottom of each square on the periodic table. It is often a number that involves decimal places because the average atomic mass is actually the weighted average of all the atomic masses of the naturally occurring elements and isotopes. So all the elements on the periodic table are actually a mixture of various isotopes. For example, when you look at carbon atoms, all of the carbon atoms that exist in the universe are mostly carbon-12, but there are a few carbon-13 isotopes, and there are some carbon-14 isotopes as well. And if I take all of those isotopes and I average them together, then that is the atomic mass that appears in the bottom of the periodic table. Now that atomic mass is calculated using the percent abundance of each isotope. If you look at all the naturally occurring copper that exists, about 69% of it is copper 63, and about 30 or 31% is copper 65. So I can calculate the average atomic mass by taking the percentage of each isotope and adding them together. So 69% is the same as 0 0.6915, and I'm going to multiply that times the mass of a copper 63 isotope, which is 62. 0.929601. So take these two numbers and multiply them together. And then I'm going to add that to 30% or 0.3085 times the mass of a copper 65 isotope. 64.9276. Plug all of this information into your calculator, and you should get an answer of 63.55, which is the same number as the number on the periodic table representing the atomic mass for copper. Finally, I can perform calculations with atoms by counting them into units called moles. Now, you've probably heard of the word mole used to describe a little rodent that crawls around and digs tunnels in your yard. But in chemistry, a mole is a measure of quantity. 
other measurements of quantity that you might use in your everyday life would be like the word dozen. You could have a dozen eggs, you could have a dozen shoes, you could have a dozen cars, but in all of those situations, a dozen is equal to 12. So 12 eggs, 12 shoes, 12 cars. When you're measuring quantities of items in chemistry, we're often dealing with particles that are significantly smaller than eggs or cars or shoes. And so we'll need to use a number that is much bigger than a dozen. The number that we're going to use is called Avogadro's number. Now Amadeo Avogadro was an Italian chemist who determined that the number of items in one mole of any substance is equal to this number right here. Now normally we simplify that number down to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd but that number represents the number of items in one mole of any substance. Technically, it's possible to have one mole of anything. I could have a mole of eggs, I could have a mole of shoes, I could have a mole of cars, but that would be a gigantic number of shoes and a whole bunch of cars. Now the mass of one mole of any substance is called its molar mass. The unit for molar mass is grams per mole. If I was weighing one mole of eggs, it would have a mass that is very different than one mole of cars. Since cars are much bigger and heavier than eggs, one mole of cars would weigh a lot more than one mole of eggs. The same is true for atoms. Now I can use the number at the bottom of each square on the periodic table to determine the molar mass of that element. So the atomic mass of carbon is 12.01, but if I had one mole of carbon, that is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd carbon atoms, it would have the exact same mass, 12.01, but now it would be in grams per mole. If you look at oxygen, the atomic mass of oxygen is 16. That's per oxygen atom. But if I had a mole of oxygen, that is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd oxygen atoms, it would also have a mass of 16, but its unit would be in grams per mole. Now I can use dimensional analysis to do conversions between units like mass and moles and particles. And you'll need to make sure that you copy this flowchart down into your notes for easy reference later. Here are a couple of examples of how to use that flowchart when converting between mass, moles, and particles. What is the mass in grams of 2.25 moles of the element iron? So the first thing I do when I'm doing dimensional analysis is write down the number that's given. 2.25 moles of iron, set up my t-chart, transfer the unit that's on top to the bottom of the next box, and write what I can convert to on top. Now when you're looking at the mole conversion chart, I can only convert to the boxes that are directly next to whatever unit I'm starting with. So if I start at moles, I can either go to mass or I can go to particles. So in this case, I want to go to mass. And then anytime I'm converting between mass and moles, I'll use the molar mass of iron. So I'm going to put the 55.85 grams of iron on the top and one mole in the bottom. Because in one mole of iron, there are 55.85 grams. And then I would just need to multiply 2.25 moles of iron times 55.85 grams, and I would get 126 grams of iron. I can also do the reverse calculation. How many moles of calcium are in 5 grams of calcium? So again, write down what I'm given, 5 grams. Set up my t-chart. Transfer gram unit to the bottom, and now I'm going to go from grams to moles on my flowchart. In order to convert between grams and moles, I need to know the molar mass of calcium. So I can look that up on my periodic table and find that the molar mass of calcium is 40.08 grams per mole. So one mole of calcium weighs 40.08 grams. And then using dimensional analysis, I would take 5 times 1 and get 5, and divide that by 40.08 giving me an answer of 0 0.125 moles of calcium. I can also do mole conversions involving the number of particles. So how many moles of lead are in 1.5 times 10 to the 12th atoms of lead? So again, write down what I'm given.
transfer my unit, and write what I can convert to on top. So now an atom is a type of particle. So in my mole map, I'm at the top of the mole map, and the only place that I can directly convert to is moles. And in order to convert between moles and atoms, you need Avogadro's number. So one mole of any substance equals 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd items. And so I could be counting atoms or molecules or ions or anything like that. But one mole equals 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. When I divide these two numbers, I get 2.49 times 10 to the negative 12th I can also do the reverse calculation. How many atoms of aluminum are in 2.75 moles of aluminum? Following the same process, I'm going to write down what I'm given, transfer my unit, and remember when you're at the mole location on the mole map, I can either go to mass or I can go to particles. And in this case, I want to go up to particles because an atom is a particle. So I'm going to write atoms on the top. One mole of any substance is equal to 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And then all I have to do is multiply those two numbers in my calculator, and that would give me 1.66 times 10 to the 24th atoms. Lastly, I can do multi-step conversions. So what is the mass in grams of 7.5 times 10 to the 15th atoms of nickel? The process of solving each of these is always going to be the same. Start off with what you're given. 7.5 times 10 to the 15th atoms. Now this is going to have a couple different steps, so I'm going to do a nice long t-chart. Convert atoms to the bottom. And then on my mole map, even though I want to go from atoms to grams, I have to go through the unit of mole first. Since I don't want to stop at moles, I would then need to move moles to the bottom of my next box and convert to grams. Now that I have all my units set up, I can plug in my numbers. So one mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, and one mole of nickel weighs 58.69 grams. And I get that number right here, this 58 number, from my periodic table. Multiply across the top, multiply across the bottom, and then divide those two numbers to get 7.3 times 10 to the negative 7th grams. One more example. How many atoms of sulfur are in 4 grams of sulfur? So write down the value that I'm given. Again, multiple steps here. So I'm going to put grams on the bottom. And then on my mole map, from grams, I have to go to moles. And then after I solve for moles, I'll be able to solve for atoms. Anytime I'm converting between grams and moles, I need the molar mass. So I would need to look up the molar mass of sulfur on the periodic table. And one mole of sulfur weighs 32.06 grams. And then anytime I'm converting between moles and atoms, I have to use Avogadro's number. So one mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. Multiply all your top numbers. Multiply all your bottom numbers and divide to get an answer of 7.51 times 10 to the 22nd atoms.